Hi, everyone. We are going to be talking about chapter six today. That is the extension of data collection. And it is all of the methods and considerations you need to make sure that your action research is reliable, valid, and trustworthy. So I wanted to start off this with actually how Sager begins his discussion of reliability and validity. He starts off with three main reasons why it's important to have high quality action research. And the first being is our obligation for students. Of course, as we've been discussing, the purpose of action research is to improve our practice for the purpose of making positive changes for on our students and our schools and in our communities. And so this obligation is really the primary driver as to why it's important to have high quality research. Since the purpose of our research is to help students, we need to make sure that it's of the utmost quality to ensure that it's actually doing what we claim to do. Um, so reading this really kind of helps ground you into your why as to why you're doing this. And related to that, of course, your personal and collective efficacy in terms of your ability as a teacher researcher to discover and identify the the knowledge that is happening in your classroom to ask and answer the questions that you are most concerned about to improve your practice. And then of course, to contribute to the professional knowledge base. This is a great way to become a teacher leader when you have high quality evidence and research to show colleagues, your school community, parents, students, that the methods that you are proposing have validity. Um, so I wanted to start with that. And um, Sager's chapter is, it's quite short, it's 10 pages. So I do recommend it um, for just solidifying your understanding of what the concept of quality means in action research. Okay, so back to Mills chapter six. Mills chapter six starts off with uh, another case study. Uh, I really want you to pay attention to the writing style in this case study. Um, this case study was about a teacher, Allison, and she was talking about the strategies that she was using in her classroom to improve students' understanding of basic facts. And uh, just the writing style in there is what I want you to pay attention to and what I want you to try to emulate in your action research paper. So as you can see, and once you read the chapter, if you've already read it, she started off with a clear focus, the focus of her study. Um, and she kept it to just really uh, one or two variables. Um, There's so many different aspects of our practice that we want to improve, but it's important that you hone in on just a few variables that you can collect enough evidence to understand. Um, she went into detail about the intervention that she was going to use, not just listing it out, but actually talking through it and discussing it. Um, data collection using multiple different sources, different types of qualitative and quantitative data. And then um, really in terms of the reliability and validity, the error analysis discussion that she did in there. Uh, so pay careful attention to that when she talked about not just you know, student scores, okay, they got 60%, they got 80%. She really dug deeper and she looked at what kind of errors were students making when they missed a question. So something like that can really bolster the reliability and validity of your work. And of course we are going to, in the next chapter, read all about data analysis and then the reflection and the impact. So uh, just wanted to call this out and focus your attention to this case study in terms of the writing style and how you should be formatting and phrasing your work when you write your action research paper. Okay, so when we're talking about validity in action research, so the term validity is used in in other types of research as well, uh, primarily quantitative designs, but validity is the degree to which the research is accurate, that it is, the truth claims that it's making are correlating to reality, what is really happening, that it is measuring what it intends to measure. Um, so these two concepts um, are 
or really traditional concepts that you'll see in quantitative research. So internal validity, like the actual interventions or the, the design of your particular study has validity for the results that you are making. And then external validity refers to generalizability of your study to other contexts. Now, when you are thinking of this within action research, action research has a specific purpose, which is to improve your practice for the purpose of improving student outcomes. So, and, and Mills does a great job of this, Sager does a great job of this. So for research to be high quality and valid in terms of action research, is really determined by whether or not, or the effectiveness of the intervention at solving the problem. Um, and so this is something that we've talked about is it's still good research if the intervention that you try does not solve the problem, but your goal is to find evidence as to whether or not the intervention helps or hurts or unsure or leads to another question. So that's what your focus is in action research is thinking about the intervention and the problem, making sure that those are aligned and that you've chosen an intervention that has promised to address the problem and you're collecting data around that. So that is how you are, and of course, everything is tied into your specific context to create this sense of trustworthiness and credibility. Um, so again, in action research, you focus on the local context versus being concerned with results that are generalizable to every other classroom across the country or world. Um, so when the, in chapter six, Mills goes through several different paradigms for establishing research quality. Um, so research quality is sometimes called trustworthiness, quality, um, reliability and validity have some different nuances to them, but Gubda is a renowned author in qualitative research. And so Mills includes his criteria for qualitative research in terms of demonstrating the quality. So here are four of the ideas offered by Gubba that you can consider for your qualitative data sources. Um, and Mills has a great table to go through the strategy. So credibility, um, the, the confidence that you have in the truth of your findings. Um, oh, I had a note about this. Oh, um, so the, when I read the case study, um, about the math facts. So credibility, having um, confidence in her and trustworthiness in the truth of her findings, going through the error analysis, something like that bolsters their credibility. So some of the strategies are your prolonged engagement, um, triangulation and member checking, asking students or other teachers to check the results that you are finding. Um, transferability is similar to the idea of generalizability, is thinking about how the findings that you have um, that you are proposing can apply to other contexts. Um, and so in qualitative research, we are focused on collecting a lot of what we refer to as thick, rich description, where you are really describing the context. That way other teachers can read it and make judgments based on their context to see how the findings would transfer to their setting. Um, dependability is similar to the idea of reliability. Are the results garnering similar conclusions every time, the stability of them? And then confirmability, meaning that other uh, researchers or other students or other um, points of view would find similar results based on the data collected. So again, using things like triangulation and strategies to mitigate the impact of researcher bias. So this table in chapter six is very helpful for these different criteria for research quality. Um, so I went through the, the meaning of these four criteria. Um, oh, I liked this phrasing here, cred credibility, the researcher's ability to take into account the complexities that present the study. So you as a teacher researcher are the ultimate expert on the setting and the data that you're collecting. So you are able to demonstrate your credibility when you make visible all of the work that you have done to make sense of those complexities. So 
using including the narrative and excerpt from your journal, lots of description to talk about those, to deal with patterns that are not easily explained. So that creates a sense of credibility when researchers do that. So some of the strategies do prolong participation at the study site. So since you're learning how to do action research at the same time that you're doing it, that is one challenge that we have this semester is your first cycle is going to be quick. Um, the good news is your students, you will have known for at least a few months. So you do have participation in the study site beyond when you started your intervention. Um, but that is one strategy that you can use. Um, persistent observation, peer debriefing, of course, triangulation. Um, member checking is asking your students to uh, what they think of the, the findings that you have identified. Um, and for, we talked about thick detailed description, um, dependability is like overlap methods, like both quantitative and qualitative, having an audit trail, um, things like your timeline, things like keeping a researcher's journal to show what you are doing um, at different stages of the process. Um, confirmability, uh, triangulation, of course, and then reflexivity, thinking about your own identity, your position, your beliefs, all of that work that we did in um, chapter three, when we are determining the area of focus, uh, reconnaissance, all of that reflecting on our beliefs, our values, our experiences, going back to that. And that's called reflexivity when the researcher reflects on their own identity and how their own positionality is what we call it as well, how their own positionality is impacting how they are interpreting the data. So that is another strategy there too. Um, so another uh, paradigm offered in chapter six is Wolcott's methods. Um, and there are a few more than this, but um, I just drew out a few here. So the listen more, talk less strategy. Um, and of, Mills talks about how giving students the opportunity to talk, lots of wait time, um, making sure that you have very accurate records, um, let readers see the data for themselves. And this is a question several people have asked in perusal is what do you do with your data once we get to chapter seven and then writing up action research, that will be clear, but including excerpts of your data in your written report, it might be a table, a graph, photograph, um, an excerpt of an interview to provide that transparency. And then of course, report fully, don't omit discrepancies or unexpected findings because those are important um, pieces of complexity. And so that's an opportunity for you to discuss them even if you don't have a full um, idea yet of why, maybe it leads to another question for the future, but fully addressing it and discussing it. Okay, so that is under the umbrella of validity. Does the research measure what it is claiming to measure? Now, reliability has to do with the consistency of a measurement over time, like you're getting the same results over and over and over again. The classic example, well, a few classic examples, one would be like a personality inventory um, and I'm not an expert in this, but psychologists claim that personality is static over time. And so therefore a good, a reliable personality assessment will give you the same results every single time. Um, so that is what reliable re reliability means. Um, and so it's important to make sure that it, it, le it leads to the trustworthiness and the quality of your research when it's reliable because the results that you gathered were not just a one-off. They're things that would happen again. Um, and so this is an opportunity for you to think about what could have happened perhaps in, um, I think I had this on the next slide, um, something like a confounding variable that could have led to you getting results that you wouldn't normally get. Um, so like an error in measurement, like maybe there is a confusing test item or a survey question that was unclear. This happens. This is very common. So your job as the researcher is to try to preview your surveys, your research instruments to make sure that they are going to be reliable. And then after you've used them, if, they, if you found that there is an issue with them, talk about that in your report and make an adjustment. Um, and so the chapter also talks a lot about the relationship between reliability and validity and how it's possible for 
something to be reliable, but not valid. Um, so some strategies that you can use to ensure that your action research is valid, use consistent data collection measures and resolve any differences um, when they arise. Okay, so now this idea of generalizability. So the goal in action research is not for, is to identify um, research-based strategies that can be applied in any setting. It is, again, for the purpose of improving your own practice. However, there still are elements that can make it generalizable. So th this is really important to include your rich description. Like for instance, the case study in this chapter talking about multiplication facts, There, that's something that I can relate to because I teach third grade and so I do teach multiplication and division. So although I might do things differently, there were some elements from that work that I could, that could transfer to my setting. Um, so again, primary goal is your context specific problem. And then, um, trying to generalize into the broader prop population is not your priority, but it could transfer to another period that you have another year. It could influence your colleagues. Um, so it could have some impact in that way. Okay, so another important thing when thinking about validity of your work is how your personal bias is going to impact the findings that you have collected. And this is an idea that we've talked about the entire time. So as the educator, as the teacher researcher, you have a huge impact on every decision along the way. You chose the area of focus, which is a reflection of what you think is important. You chose the intervention, which is a reflection on what you believe, uh, along with consulting the literature could help. So this is, and then you're the one teaching the intervention, you're the one collecting the data, you're the one analyzing the data. So you are very important in how that data is interpreted, but you do want to have a sense of credibility um, in your findings. So we all have biases that we bring to our lives in every single capacity, including our teaching, including our research, all of our preconceived beliefs and assumptions and so during the reconnaissance process, we tried to make visible some of those beliefs and that will help you try to think about ways that your biases may be impacting your interpretations and talking about that um, is very important. Um, so the, if, if you are not doing a good job being engaging in reflexivity, which is reflecting on how your personal biases and your positionality are impacting your interpretation of the results, it could lead to um, an interpretation of the data that is biased, like this reinforcing your existing beliefs and it could limit the study's objectivity. Now, action, in, in my opinion, action research is never going to be completely objective. I really don't think any research is, but um, it's, it's not going to be objective because, again, it is situated within your context. And so the chapter does talk through a few different strategies that you can use um, to bolster the quality of your research and to address the impact of researcher bias. So acknowledge your biases, think about your positionality, your experiences in education, your experiences as a student, your um, assumptions about the curriculum, the content matter, how all of those could impact your study. Um, Mills gives the strategy of using propositions where you write a list of statements about your expected outcomes. I think that this is a very useful strategy um, for you to do. So when you are drafting your action research plan, when you're collecting data, you can start to write down a list of statements, what you believe is going to happen. And this will help you be transparent about what your beliefs are, and then give you a check to go off of when you are interpreting the data. And it might be that after we get through chapter seven and we analyze the data, it might be that your expected outcomes are what you thought they would be. But if that happens, that gives you a good researcher who has strong reflexivity would say, okay, let me go back and make sure I have another data source to check that because this is an expected outcome that's being confirmed to make 
make sure that you are being fair about that. And if it's something different, um, you can also have that there as well. Um, re reviewing the literature, going back to that, um, and thinking about if any of your assumptions are impacting the, not only the literature you're including, but your findings. And then of course, seeking feedback from a cr critical friend. These all pair well together too. If you have your list of propositions, you can go to your critical friend and say, hey, this is the outcome that I um, expected here is a data source that's showing that. And your critical friend would say, well, do you have any other data sources that are showing that? What about this to help you look for that? And always I um, encourage you to search for the complexity um, to find maybe even if all of your data sources are saying one thing, where is the nuance in there that offers an additional glimmer to help you understand the issue in a way that you maybe didn't before? Okay, so back to Sager. Um, so Sager offered a few questions that you can ask yourself when you are going through the process. Um, so once you get to the stage where you are analyzing your data, um, you can ask yourself, is this information an accurate representation of reality? Um, again, this is coming back to the idea of validity. Is it truly reflecting what's happening in your research context? Um, can you think of any reasons to be uh, suspicious of its accuracy? And this is related to the idea of a confounding variable. This is when something other than your in intervention is impacting your results. So um, it you might see an increase in student achievement, but it's not actually because of your intervention, it's because of something else. So it's important to talk about that in your research paper and say, you know, I saw these results, however, these are some things that happened. And oftentimes it's, this is real life. Things will happen outside of your control and education, and they might have a positive impact. Maybe you are studying um, the impact of a particular grouping strategy with students on student achievement. And then outside of your control, those students start participating in um, a tutoring program. And so you see increased results, but it's kind of hard for you to know to what degree is it because of the tutoring? To what degree is it because of the grouping? So you would discuss that and talk about that as being a potentially confounding variable. And then what factors or variables could be interfering with your findings like we talked about there. Okay, and then this is also the time to use some of those strategies discussed in chapter six. So I highly recommend that everyone create a triangulation matrix, even if you just have one research question. I noticed that several people have multiple variables that they're looking at. Maybe they're looking at student motivation and they're looking at student achievement. You're going to want to have um, break that down into two different research questions. What is the impact of X on motivation? What is the impact of X on student achievement? And then map out what your data sources are going to be for all of those. So you can ensure you have multiple data sources to shine light on what is happening there. Um, and then this is another visual for um, triangulation that you can use there. So um, that is a little overview of reliability and validity. Um, so I look forward to your questions and comments about this chapter.